uh, give a yeah so thank you everyone uh, for coming and uh, we are privileged to have today Jan Ma who is a professor at the HDSI the Halicio Blue Data Science Institute uh, in uh, UCSD and he's also affiliated with the computer science department uh, so Jan is a statistician with a very like a pretty wide interest um, and uh, he graduated uh, from University of Washington, followed by a postdoc in Mike Jordan's group in UC Berkeley. Um, he's interested in all kinds of sequential de decision-making problems, Bayesian inference method to quantify uncertainty, prediction of complex methods, uh, reinforcement learning, and so on. Uh, Ian is an integral part uh, of the TILOS project. And uh, we are, uh, his talk title seems very interesting and informative. It's uh, the battle of MCMC and variational inference. Uh, so we are all waiting for what uh, Jan has to say. And Jan, again, it's uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Aria, for the very nice introduction. Um, yeah, um, so I guess the motivation of this uh, talk is, uh, is about pandemic. Um, so nowadays we see that the, it seems like the case number has been dropping quickly and, and we have the hope of coming back to campus, you know, full-fledged. Um, but I, I'm sure that the pandemic is still on everybody's mind and we have all wanted to be able to do something about it. Um, so we've decided that uh, we would prepare ourselves for the next epidemic, hoping that it doesn't turn into a full-fledged pandemic. Um, and from this pandemic, what we realized is that early response is crucial in the sense that if we can make predictions about where the next out outbreak hotspots are, then we can make preparations for it. Right? That will save us a lot of resource and time in terms of logistics. Uh, but we also know from this pandemic that uh, it, during the onset of the pandemic, there's very little training data to train our models, right? So a lot of us have turned to compartmental models, be able to make use of internal mechanisms of disease transmission to reduce model complexity. So we started collaborating with two epidemiologists who have been working on mechanistic models of disease transmission for the past 30 years. And they have a very nice agent-based simulator, which takes into account age structures in population centers and commuting networks within these, those population centers, as well as airport networks across those population centers. Um, so it's a, it's a very comprehensive, very, very nice agent-based simulation models. Um, and it captures the long-term trend of the pandemic uh, onset very well. Uh, but the downside of it is that uh, it's computationally prohibitive in the sense that to be able to make a prediction one month ahead of time, uh, this simulator needs to run for about a week, a whole week on several supercomputers to be able to generate the result. Um, so it takes a lot of computation resource. Um, so they asked us, um, if only we can sort of somehow remember the dynamics, uh, interpolating the dynamics between different scenarios or even extrapolating them, that will save us a lot of time and energy. Um, so we thought, okay, so perhaps a neural network is quite fitting for in, in this case, right? We can design a neural network that's convolution in space about the transmission and recurrent in time so that we can propagate in time to faithfully sort of learn a surrogate model to this disease transmission dynamics. Right. And we can make this a probabilistic neural network so that we can not only just give a prediction, but also quantify uncertainty of the predictions, which is important to, to the epidemic experts. Um, and so we would query this simulator in different scenarios, and then we would build this probabilistic neural network. But we know that uh, simulation is expensive, right? so we wish to query this simulator as little as possible. For example, uh, let's say th this, we are interested in, in two parameters of the disease transmission. One is latent period of the disease. Another is the transmission rate of that disease. Uh, then we would query sort of combinations of those two parameters, right? And learn a model, train a model using, let's say two data points with, with different combinations of those two parameters. 
And uh, for example, let's say in this stage, uh, the interpolation between those two data points are, you know, are doing pretty well, but extrapolating far away from it may, might be difficult, right? So uh, if we know the error landscape, then the mean absolute error might be higher, far away from the data points we have already queried. So the next point we should query is probably somewhere around here, right? So, so that we, we can reduce the error overall. Um, but in practice, we won't be able to know the error landscape. Right? So, so we need some way to in, indicate where to query next. Um, so we took a Bayesian active learning approach where uh, we would learn a, an acquisition function, which uh, quantifies the uncertainty of a set of latent variables. And using this acquisition function, uh, we can maximize it to find the next point to query, which is the highest uncertainty, which contains the highest uncertainty of the latent variable. Right? And then after querying, we retrain a model based on the new data points and the error would, would the error landscape was changed. Right? And then next we would, we would recalculate this acquisition function over the new model and then maximize it and find the next point to query and do this iteratively. Um, so we tested this kind of method on a toy model, which is the SEIR model that contains exactly the same two parameters that, that we talked about. Um, so right out of the bat, we compared against a sort of Gaussian process model. And what we see is that the Gaussian process model does not have the enough capacity to capture those non-stationary behavior from disease transmission. Um, so, so the error doesn't really drop. Um, and the solid lines represent the training using the neural network model. Um, and this black dash line uh, represents training with all the data points we have at hand. So the quicker we get to this black dash line, the better. Um, a sort of a nice uh, baseline to compare against is the random sampling approach, where we just randomly sample those data points coming out from this data, data set. Um, and we can see that uh, our uh, using our neural network model and using the sort of uh, acquisition function that we constructed, uh, it gets to the black line pretty quickly uh, in terms of, in the sense that at 4% amount of data, it's pretty much converged. Uh, there are also other ways to capture uncertainty. For example, if we can directly capture uncertainty in the posterior prediction, uh, it also has some benefits uh, over the random sampling approach. Um, and we can actually prove using random matrix theory that in a random feature model, if we just randomly sample the parameters, that will lead to an error on the order of dimensions squared over square root of the number of samples of data we query. Uh, so this can be relatively large right, uh, when the dimension is higher. Uh, whereas if we greedily optimize the posterior predictive variance, then that will lead to an error that scales linearly in that dimension um, over also square root of an n. So in some sense, this indicates that in higher dimension, the, the performance sh increase should be even larger as compared to the random sampling approach. Right? So, so we tried it um, with, uh, with the real deal, which has 10,000 parameters in this sort of the large simulation, the large simulator. Um, the result we got was uh, somewhat puzzling in the sense that uh, the performance gain is still similar to, to the performance gain in two dimensions. And what's even more puzzling is that if we, if we use this estimated standard deviation over the posterior prediction, uh, it's actually performing worse than the random sampling approach. Um, so we looked into it, and, and what we realized was that in higher dimension, capturing uncertainty of those posterior prediction is also more difficult. So in higher dimension, there's more error in, in, the, in uh, calculating this uh, sort of this acquisition function, right? And optimizing it sometimes will just move us further away from the target. So what have we learned from this practice? So, so we learned that capturing uncertainty is crucial, right? In the sense that we really need accurate uncertainty quantification for inform the decisions to be made, right? And also to understand the credibility of our predictions. 
Um, and we need computationally tractable methods to do so. Right? And when thinking about computational tractability, what we're really talking about is scalability, right? So how those computation, how the, how the computation scales with the problem complexity. And for com problem complexity, we're oftentimes interested in model complexity in the sense that, uh, let's say in a neural network, the dimension of the parameter space can scale easily beyond orders of millions. And we want our computational methods to converge in a number of iterations at, at most linearly, with the scales at most linearly with the dimension, right? And we can also think about data complexity where we might just have tons and tons of data, right? For example, we might be interested in understanding what are the topics that are going on online might also be interested in a long neural recordings, or we might want to make decisions on the fly where we may, we may do sequential decision-making. In all those cases, the size of the data set tends to grow over time. We don't want our computational in infrastructure to just break down in the face of the growing data set. Okay. And we oftentimes don't just want to run our algorithm for a while and say that's the best we can do. A lot of times we want some sort of guarantee, some sort of statistical guarantee oftentimes come in the form of the error, right? And in terms of, let's say, uh, measuring those, the, the uncertainty quantification in terms of distributions, it's often measured in terms of a KO divergence from the current distribution that we predict and the target distribution that we're interested in. Um, so, uh, the background of this problem is that we'll have an inferential problem where we build a probabilistic model modeling the, uh, the probability of observations given the parameters. And focusing on the parameters, this is the likelihood of those parameters. Um, and the objective function we're interested in is the negative log likelihood incorporated with prior information or regularizer, depending on the context we're in. And our goal is to infer the parameter from the data set. Right? By inference, we, we mean that we want to estimate of the parameter, but also a uncertainty quantification of this estimated. Um, so there are two typical approaches to, to attack this objective function. The one is the optimization approach where we locate uh, the minimum of the objective function or find the most likely from the setting. Another is the Bayesian inference approach where we sample from the posterior distribution which is proportional to e to the negative objective function, or let's focus on the parameter space, which is just called a target distribution, uh, which quantifies uncertainty of the model given the data set. Okay. Um, so those two approaches can actually be formulated in as two optimization problems. Uh, one optimization problem directly minimize the objective function and approach the Opt, uh, optimizer of this objective function in, in the Euclidean space a lot of times. Uh, whereas for the Bayesian inference problem, we want to minimize the KO divergence between, let's say, the current distribution and the target distribution. So it's an optimization problem on the space of probability, right? And then we want to approach this target distribution. So maybe we can draw some inspiration from Euclidean space and see how optimization is done there and it may be translated over to the probability space. Um, so in finite dimension, in, uh, in Euclidean space, um, oftentimes a popular algorithm is the gradient descent algorithm, right, which iterates the parameter theta using the negative gradient direction. Right? Figuratively, it looks quite simple. It basically follows along the negative gradient direction to the local minimum. Um, on the space of probabilities, we can do something similar, right? We can first find out what's the gradient of the KO divergence, right? And, and to remind us that the KO divergence is expectation of log current distribution over the target one. Um, so it turns out that the gradient of the KO divergence can be sort of easily written as a vector field, which is gradient of the log current distribution over the target one for every theta distributed according to the current distribution. So this gives us an update rule, right? So for every theta k distributed according to the current distribution, tk, uh, we can use the following update rule to update every point 
in, in the space. I every every see that case. Um, but the difficulty appears in here in the sense that we need to take a gradient of the log current distribution. Um, so if we want to directly estimate the current distribution using samples, then this is a density estimator problem. And, and we need to also be able to take a gradient of that. So this requires a very high accuracy density estimator that requires a, a humongous amount of samples. Um, so in practice, this, especially in higher dimensions, this is not practical. So there are two ways to, to go from there. Uh, one way is to explicitly parameterize the current distribution, PK, right, using a finite number of parameters. Right? So that corresponds to the variational inference. Basically, we would have parameterized an infinite dimensional object, that's the distribution, by, fin by a, a finite amount of parameters. Um, but there is another way, that's to use an equivalent process to the negative gradient of the log current distribution. Right? We can look at the continuous limit when the step size h goes to zero, actually this negative gradient of the log current distribution is equivalent to a sort of Gaussian random variable, to a ground emotion. Um, so this gives us another way to make the updates. So basically we can substitute this complicated term, this negative gradient log current distribution by a Gaussian random variable. Then this makes the, the update rule a lot simpler. Right. And then we can, to further simplify the denotations, we can use gradient over the objective function to substitute in for the you know, gradient of the log target distribution. Right. Okay. So to, we can relate this back to the gradient descent algorithm. Right. This is basically a gradient descent plus a Gaussian random variable. Right. So, and this is oftentimes called a launch ran algorithm, MCMC. Um, so figuratively, uh, what this looks like is that roughly it will follow along the negative gradient direction, but it also has this Gaussian random noise kicking it around, uh, exploring this space, capturing the uncertainty. So a natural question uh, from these two approaches is that um, if we compare variational inference against the MCMC, which one is more efficient? in the sense that if we look at a picture, a typical picture of a comparison between MCMC and, and, and variational inference, we can see that oftentimes MCMC approach, the, the convergence is relatively slow, but it keeps decreasing towards the, the minimum of the, in the KO divergence. Whereas if we look at the variational inference, here we use the black box variational inference without assuming a structure of the posterior distribution, um, the convergence initially is, uh, is faster, but it quickly plateaus right, and does not decrease anymore. So this generates the following folklore, uh, saying that variational inference is fast but biased, and CMC is unbiased but slow. But uh, we would like to see whether this is indeed the truth, or in terms of convergence rate, um, uh, is variational inference really faster than MCMC by a certain factor that scales with the problem complexity, or is it just a constant difference? Right. Um, so the question is BBVI versus MCMC, which is the faster? Um, so for MCMC, there's an existing result saying that if we assume that the objective function is strongly convex and looks just smooth, uh, then the Lange Ren algorithm will converge in number of iterations that scales like dimension over epsilon, which is the accuracy requirement. And to be able to capture uncertainty or estimate expectation of a Lipschitz function um, over, the over the distribution, it only requires the big old one number of MCMC chains to do so. So, so this is existing work. Um, let's maybe compare it to variational inference. So for variational inference, uh, let's first remove the bias and focus solely on the convergence rate, right? Because taking into account the bias, uh, it's difficult to, to compare to something that does not have asymptotic bias. Um, so let's assume that 
this objective function is quadratic, although in the algorithm, we do not know it. Um, and for that objective function also being strongly convex and Lipschitz smooth, it actually requires the number of samples to compute a stochastic gradient, estimated stochastic gradient. And using that stochastic gradient, the convergence rate is d over epsilon, the same as the number of iterations for a large man algorithm. So let's say if we have d number of parallel machines to compute the gradient at a certain time, then the convergence rate is the same as MCMC. So it, it, right off the bat, it does not seem like variational inference is any more efficient or any faster than MCMC approaches. Let's maybe uh, take a quick look at why this is the case. Um, so the intuition. Yeah, uh, yes. a quick, quick question. So, but you need parallelization because it still seems you require you require d over al alpha samples. Exactly. Or, yes. So, so if let's say we only have one per, one machine, then the convergence rate is actually d squared over epsilon. So it's actually slower than MCMC. <laughs> Yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's uh, the, the, some, some. Yeah, some of the folks are uh, kind of puzzled uh, with this uh, observation. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so what we were at first. Um, so, uh, we we thought we'd uh, maybe look into why this is the case. Um, so. First of all, we notice that uh, we need to capture covariance structure in the variational inference to converge in KO divergence. Otherwise, uh, the, the the error would grow without bound. Um, you know, according to the, the the various factors in the algorithm. Right. So let's say that we use a precision matrix to parameterize a Gaussian family. Um, then the gradient over this precision matrix of the KL divergence uh, would look somewhat like the following. It, it would look like expectation of gradient of the precision matrix of the log current distribution, the log approximate distribution times the logarithm of the approximate distribution over the target distribution. Okay. Um, and uh, because here we have something that's unknown, so we have to estimate it using samples from this current distribution or approximate distribution, right? And from optimization theory, we know that the convergence rates are constrained by this gradient variance, right? So, so the key is to figure out what's the gradient variance. Um, so this part, this upper part is fine in the sense that uh, because we're parameterizing it using a Gaussian family, so we can explicitly integrate this part because it only involves the approximate distribution, right? So, so this part, estimating this part does not have variance. The difficulty comes in from the lower, the bottom part, where we have a log target distribution, which we do not know the explicit form and we cannot integrate over. Right? We, we have to estimate it using samples. Um, so now the, the variance comes in from this part. Um, and for, let's say, the approximate distribution coming from this, uh, this Gaussian family, the gradient of over the precision matrix is, you know, theta theta transpose. And let's say this, uh, this posterior distribution is scales like a Gaussian, then the logarithm of it scales like a quadratic form, right? So multiplying those, it's estimation of a fourth order moment, right? And this will give us a variance of d squared. So that's, that's where this d squared coming from. So that's why we need at least d squared number of queries to the gradient queries to be able to estimate, the, uh, to be able to converge overall, right? But of course, there's some benefit uh, coming in, coming out from this variational inference approach in the sense that we can trade the number of samples to estimate the, the stochastic gradient for the convergence time, right? 
For example, if we have just huge amount of parallel machines, let's say we, if we have d squared and above parallel machines, then the convergence time is very fast. Right? It's big old one. So th there are some additional flexibility in variational inference right, beyond, let's say, MCNC approach and some of the other approaches. Um, now, another question we can ask is, can we make further use of this flexibility? So let's say if we can allow for larger bias, can we trade bias in for variance with the variational inference? Okay. Uh, for example, we can make we can make use of a more restrictive parameterization, right? and maybe we can accelerate the computation in, in this case. Um, so one one idea is that to parameterize this precision matrix, we can use a low rank plus plus a diagonal uh, factor to parameterize it so that the number of parameters will, will no longer be number of, will no longer be d squared, right? In this sort of uh, precision matrix, right? So let's say if we only examine the low rank structure up to rank P, then we can actually find that the gradient variance now scales like P times D instead of D squared. So if we have a constant p, then you know we can expect the convergence rates to be you know a lot faster, right? And indeed, this is the case where using overall using p times d number of samples, uh, we can actually prove that the KO divergence will be upper bounded um, by by a certain factor with a sort of one over epsilon number of iterations. Right, so the overall com uh, com computation complexity now is p times d over epsilon instead of d squared over epsilon. And the error in the KO divergence now factorizes into two terms. Uh, so here, those lambda star case, uh, they are the eigenvalues of the posterior precision matrix minus the diagonal matrix. Right. So now there are uh, sort of two factors. One, one part comes in from optimization part, where if we take more iterations, we just keep decreasing it, right? So this part can be removed um, with more computation, whereas another part is approximation error, where it comes in from the factor that we're not taking into account the full rank matrices. Right? So we're, we're omitting the, these uh, matrices for ranks above P plus one, right? So this part depends on how large this P is. Right? Um, so figuratively, this looks like the following, where if we take rank equal to, let's say, two or eight, those lower ranks, um, the decrease is fast, the convergence is faster, but the bias is larger. Whereas if we take a larger rank, let's say rank equal to 64, the convergence is slower, but the bias is also slower, no, but, but the bias is smaller. We can also think about a sort of statistical computational trade-off, right? In the sense that we can ask, do we really want to use all those ranks anyway? Right? For example, if we suppose we have a linear model, which is like a, a, a linear fun function plus uh, the error. And let's say we're interested in understanding the insert, this variance in, in, the, in, the, in the data points X then with the n data points and uh, big old in the same gradient samples, we can prove that uh, using the posterior mean estimator, we can estimate uh, the different, we can estimate in the, diff in the error to this true, true precision matrix to the same optimization error plus approximation error and plus one term that's statistical that, that's irremovable, however, however much many computation resource we store at it. And this scales like d squared over n. And let's say, let's assume that the true precision matrix scales like, you know, say k to the negative factor, uh, a factor that's larger than a half. Then the optimal rank to choose in this case scales like n over d squared. So if the number of data points that we collect is not much larger than dimension squared, then actually we should just choose a rank that's constant, right? That's, that's not scaling with dimension D. So 
So in those cases, uh, a constant selection of the optimal of the rank will already suffice. Okay. So so we can all, we can trade off uh, this this bias uh, almost for free. Okay. Okay. So we can also ask sort of how general are those results, right? Um, so for example, for MCMC, those results will extend to the cases where uh, the posterior distribution or the target distribution is log concave plus some small perturbations where most of the posterior probability mass is. If the posterior probability mass is small, we don't have to worry too much about it. Um, for variational inference, if we only care about reaching the stationarity, then the, this result will extend to uh, the log posterior distribution is concave in expectation, where the expectation is taken over a class of normal distributions, um, which are which have nice conditioning. So this is actually more general than the sort of high probability uh, requirement for for those for the for the for the MCMC approach. Uh, but of course, uh, the trade-off is that there might be unbounded bias coming from this part, because this part we are only stating about reaching stationarity and the difference between stationarity to the, to the truth, uh, we do not have a bound. Okay. Um, okay, so in the previous discussion, we've been focused primarily on the dimension dependence of those problems. And there is always a deep dimension D dependence in those algorithms. Right. So, so the folklore goes to the following, that the computation complexity of the MCMC or variational inference methods, uh, it always depends on the dimension uh, if we're interested in distributions on RD. Um, and the question, and, and this question is somewhat, uh, is somewhat raised uh, by the observation from the comparison between Langevin algorithms and the gradient descent algorithms, where both focused on non-asymptotic convergence rates with convexity assumptions. Um, but the conspicuous distinction is that um, the large mirror algorithms convergence rate always have a dimension dependence, whereas in optimization, the say gradient descent type of algorithms do not have a di dimension dependence in it. So a natural question is, can large mirror algorithms convergence time be become dimension independent in R RD under some general you know, convexity assumption. Right? Um, so let's maybe first look at why there is this dimension dependence in previous approaches. Um, so in previous approaches, uh, the way we are analyzing those Langevin algorithms is that we would discretize a Langevin dynamics, a continuous time Langevin dynamics that preserves the posterior. Right? So for example, we will have a continuous dynamics, that's the Brown emotion plus the gradient flow, which is equivalent to, uh, for any theta t distributed according to PT, uh, you taking a sort of gradient flow on the probability space. Right? And, uh, and it will have linear convergence with sort of perturbations of the convexity. Um, Whereas after discretization, the algorithm looks like the following, where we're no longer evaluating gradient uh, at theta t, right? We're evaluating gradient at a previous iteration because that's the best we can do. And then plus a Gaussian random noise. So it's equivalent to a sort of gradient flow dynamics that are evaluating gradients at two different points. So corresponding to this Gaussian random variable we're evaluating gradient on at the theta t at uh, along with the continuous trajectory, whereas for the for this gradient descent step we're evaluating gradient at the previous step. Right, so gradients are evaluated at different points. This is an additional error in, in addition to the gradient descent kind of error. Right, so it's like telling the algorithm. So for one part, we should follow along this windy path that's, that, that has gradient depending on every point on the way. And for the other part, it's telling the, the, the algorithm that you should just follow the initial direction and go along a direct straight, straight line. Right? So of course there's discrepancy between those two points. Right? 
And this discrepancy oftentimes leads to an error in the form of the variance of, uh, from, of the difference in theta t minus theta k. And looking at the iteration, this will correspond to a Gaussian random variable. Right? So the variance of the Gaussian random variable will scale like t. Right? So this is where the dimension dependence comes from. Um, so nowhere in this analysis does convexity or anything come into play. Right? So we can ask you know, whether we can use convex, convex optimization methods perspective to help or is convexity just not relevant here? So I've been discussing uh, this question uh, with, with Tong Zhang and, and with your Fruin. Um, and Tong, just, Tong asked, why don't we just skip the continuous analysis and, and take a directly take a discrete time perspective um, in the sense that uh, we can decompose the KO divergence into two parts. One part is the self-entropy. Another part is the cross-entropy, right? It's the, expectation of the objective function. That's the cross entropy between the current distribution and the target one. So why don't we take sort of a composite optimization viewpoint that decompose this whole process of, of, of launch variant algorithm into two parts that opt each optimizing one part of the objective. Um, so we can indeed write down uh, this, uh, decompose this launch variant algorithm into two steps. One step is pure gradient descent over the objective function, which is also gradient descent on this cross entropy term. Another step is that we'll add a Gaussian random noise to it. So which we can find that this is a gradient descent on the self entropy. And we can write this out like this. Um, so focusing on this algorithm, algorithmic box, this is gradient descent first on the self entropy, then on the uh, on the cross entropy. Okay. Um, so we can analyze this this step, which where we can make use of geodesic convexity of the self entropy to write something just like in convex optimization that we have difference in the self entropy is upper bounded by the difference in the in the two Wallis time dis distance, which Translating to Euclidean space is just the, the, the two norm uh, of the distance of the differences and the difference of them. Um, so this is a classical in convex optimization, right? And then we can also make use of the convexity of the objective function to have the, to upper bound the difference in the cross entropy term right? by also the similar terms. And what's important is that now we can align those two points at the same at the same initial point in PK, and then adding them will lead to the difference in the KO divergence directly, which is what we wish to bound, right? we, which is what we set out to bound. And uh, using classical convex optimization methods, um, we can expand this recursion uh, and taking a shrinking step size like one over square root of k will lead to a one over square root of k convergence rate. And now the dimension dependence is only comes in from the initial condition. Um, and uh, to examine cases where there's no, no longer dimension dependence in the initial condition, we can cons consider posteriors of the following form where we have a likelihood function, which, is, which scales like e to the negative f, and F would, com com would correspond to empirical risk. And it's oftentimes gonna have complex form. Um, where, and the prior distribution, let's say it's proportional to e to the g of theta, which corresponds to the regularizer, which oftentimes is simple and can be explicitly computed. Uh, oftentimes, you know, we can take a L2 or L1 regularizer, which can all be explicitly integrated with a Brownian motion. Assuming those are true, then for Lipschitz continuous objective uh, empirical risk function, we can find that the convergence rate will scale like the Lipschitz continuity squared over the strong convexity of, the, of this regularizer uh, times one over K, where there's no longer this dimension dependence anymore. Um, 
And the reason for that is that um, we can initialize from a distribution that's proportional to uh, the prior distribution um, so that uh, it's, it's not as far away from the, from the posterior distribution that we're interested in. And similarly, uh, we have the, ob obtained a similar result for Lipschitz smooth objective function uh, and assume that it has this following rich separable form where each of this uh, activation function is Lipschitz smooth. Uh, in this case, we get the classical convergence rates of uh, you know, uh, Lipschitz smoothness squared over strong convexity squared times one over K for, for stochastic optimization. Okay. Um, okay, so now basically we, we, we can see that just like optimization, uh, the MCMC approach can also have convergence rates that's dimension independent. So we can also work on the functional space now. Right? And so this will be applicable to a, a range of control problems where a lot of times we want to generate samples or do optimization on the functional space. Um, but sort of one restriction in applying directly to the control problems or sequential decision-making problem uh, is that uh, so if we use this sort of Thompson sampling approach, uh, which we'll, I'll, I'll explain in a minute, um, in practice, um, a lot of times people would say that this approach is only practical with conjugate family of the posterior distribution. It's not applicable when you have to make, you know, MCMT or variational inference, those approximate inference methods. Um, and recently there has been a paper basically arguing that even a small inference error can lead to a poor performance of the, of the, in those sequential decision-making problems. Um, so a question is whether we can indeed uh, make the sort of sampling approach work uh, with the approximate sampling. Um, so let's look at a sort of simple scenario where we have a bandit problem, where we have a few number of decisions we can make and Along with each decision, there is a prob there is a reward that's given out uh, probabilistically, and we can model this reward distribution using a parametric family. And our goal is to make decisions based on learning this parameters. And let's say that at a certain stage, we have collected a number of data points, a, a number of rewards for each arm. Um, then this is a this can be used as a likelihood for the for the parameters right, given the data set and incorporated with a prior distribution over those this, over those parameters we can form this posterior distribution and let's say acco according to each of those options each of those choices uh the, the posterior distribution looks like the following then we can use the following so-called thompson sampling approach which generates a random sample according to those posterior distributions and then condition on those samples uh, we can compute the expected reward using our likelihood function right? and then we would choose the action by maximizing this expected reward right? and then this will lead to optimal regret so the difficulty of this approach, the challenge of this approach, is that oftentimes it's hard to generate exact samples right, from this Thompson sampling approach. So we can think about either using the MCMC approach or the variational inference approach. And what we wish to get is that we wish to still keep this optimal regret from this Thompson sampling approach the, the, uh, and with reasonable computation. We don't want the computation to increase over time. Okay. Um, but the challenge is that we have a growing data set, right? As we make more decisions, we collect more and more data points, right? The size N of the data set grows over time. Um, and also just like what this previous paper has demonstrated, actually, if, if we just keep a constant error, then the performance will be poor in the end. So the error needs to shrink like one over square root of the n, one over square root of the, the time we play this game to obtain, the, to achieve this optimal regret. Right? So the question is, how do we achieve the best of the both worlds? Right? 
Um, okay, so when, so of course, rather than that, we cannot use full gradient method, right? Otherwise, the batch size in this gradient would grow over time. So each iteration time, the time for each iteration to run will be will grow, right? So we'd have to use a so, sort of stochastic gradient approach, right? So we can rewrite. We, we first write this true gradient as in summation of all those gradients of the log uh, likelihood over the data points. Right? But instead of this, instead of examining all the data points, we can examine only a subset of the data points, right? and then we can rescale this uh, this likelihood, the log likelihood, so that we have an unbiased estimator of the gradient, which is the stochastic gradient. And then we can think about how do we use the stochastic gradient uh, to achieve an algorithm which, which uh, converges in time. Right? So here we would choose number of n, which is the size of this subset uh, to be constant, which, is, which does not grow with the total number of data points. Um, and under this selection, uh, we can plug in this stochastic gradient into our sort of gradient update uh, into our Langevin algorithm, which is called a stochastic gradient Langevin algorithm. And we can see that the stochastic gradient error will scale like large n over a small n, right? Because of the scaling here. Um, so now it seems like uh, we have a growing error in each iteration, right? Uh, but the good thing is that we have a step size in front of it, right? So if we choose a step size, that scales like one over n, then we would get an update error that scales like one over square root of n, which is some, which is what we want, right? We want an error that scales like one over square root of n in the end, okay? Um, but then taking a smaller and smaller step size as we collect more and more data points, uh, doesn't it mean that we are making less and less progress right, in each iteration? Um, luckily, there's something else up our sleeves that we, we can use. Uh, that's the so-called posterior concentration phenomena in the sense that, let's say in round 10, the posterior looks like the following. Then in round 20, the posterior concentrates. Right? In round 30, the posterior concentrates even more. In round 40, it concentrates even more. And what's nice about this is that in the round n plus one, the posterior distribution is actually not so different from the posterior distribution in the previous round, right? So the posterior in the ne next round is close to the posterior in the previous round. Um, and we can make use of samples generated from the previous round, which would be distributed approximately close to the posterior generated in the next round, right? So we can initialize from the posterior, from the sample that we achieved in the previous round. Right. And then we won't need so much progress to be made anyway. So uh, using this kind of reusing mechanism, we found that uh, Thompson sampling with the stochastic gradient Langevin algorithm with this sort of warm initialization and the shrinking step size will take in each round constant number of iterations and constant number of samples per iteration uh, to converge to this one over square root of n accuracy to achieve this optimal regret. Um, okay, so I think that's, uh, that's mostly what I want to talk about. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Jan. This was a really nice talk. Um, so just like to ask if there is uh, anyone uh, in the audience who has any question for Jan. Well, uh, let me go ahead and I, I do have uh, a question related to this. So, so this, um, it, in the case of uh, this Bayesian inference, you have to, uh, so there is this scale divergence minimization problem and doing gradient descent on that is one way, but is it possible to use some, I, I don't know if you're aware of this, uh, or in general statisticians, how they view this Blahut Arimoto type algorithm, which is sort of uh, an information geometry approach where, so it's like, instead of gradient descent, if you are doing something like mirror descent, right? To something, 
So is there work that goes like that takes that route? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so depend. So for the mirror descent, you would uh, have to define a Bragman divergence, right? Right. Um, um, I mean, I have not. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, okay. So actually, um, so there are yeah, there there are different ways to formulate this. Um, so for example, in variational inference, there's definitely this approach where you use you directly use mirror descent because it's in sort of finite dimension and it's easier to handle. Right. Um, to construct this sort of surrogate process, um, like a Brownian motion process, uh, to do that. Um, because there are only so many random processes we can actually integrate. <laughs> so uh, our hands are in some sense tight. Um, but I think there are formulations which can help, can let you formulate using sort of samples, using random samples uh, to do mirror descent on the space of KL divergence. Um, and it depends on your formulation of the space. Because currently the the metric of the space we choose is the Wallerstein two distance. Choosing mm. different distances actually leads to different results. Um, and I think there is a choice of the metric of the space that that will help you do this mirror descent and use a particle method to do it. Right. So I, I'm just uh, saying this because um, there is this like in information theory there is this question of computing channel capacity. I don't know if you. Uh, no, so we, which is basically, I only heard about that. yeah, which is a which is some mutual information, uh, and you can write it as a KL divergence between the product of marginals. So and, and they use this type of mirror descent thing, and the results are really good. Um, okay. Do you I, sharing I, me some of the references? Yes, yeah, so it is called Blahut Arimoto algorithm, and somehow I don't know. Uh, so there is, uh, yeah, I see that there is a. I, I can share with you like more, um, like better uh, references later on. Um, but this is the wiki. I think it has a hand wavy description of what the algorithm is. Um, so um, yeah, maybe I can share with you some better references later on. Thanks. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I think there there's definitely potential to in, to improve in this area. Uh, right, say, right. I, yeah, I, I'm just wondering, maybe like maybe uh, not everyone knows about this information theoretic things, and all those statisticians knows a lot of information theory and vice versa, but but it's not like the same community even now. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think there are still lots of open questions in let's say sort of Bayesian inference. Uh, and and inferential approaches, different inferential approaches. Right. Um, yeah, I, I think for me this was a very informative talk. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks again. And um, yeah, so next month we we will have another speaker for like we are basically right now uh, deciding between two speakers for the who will be the who is going to present for next month. But until then, uh, thanks everyone for joining today. We'll see you soon. Thank you.